So this is going to be a talk on the ramifications of ISO 5230 and 18974 for legal professionals in 2024. In other words, we're talking about stuff that exists today, but we're going to talk about what it means for the year ahead. If you want to learn more about these ISO standards, you can go to the QR codes. ISO 5230 is an ISO standard since 2020 and it's focused on open source license compliance. ISO 18974 is an ISO standard since 2023. It's actually pretty new. It came out in December 2023. It's focused on open source security assurance. These ISO standards help people manage open source professionally. Now, when it comes to building standards, there's many different approaches. In the case of ISO 5230 and ISO 18974, we're looking at high-level standards, things that help you address inbound, internal, and outbound processes, but from a very high-level perspective. These are standards with scopable program size, meaning they're not too prescriptive. They're about an approach, what, rather than specific implementation, rather than how. So they set the broad picture. They focus on process points, have a process here, have a process there, as opposed to being focused on what's inside the process. This is very purposeful. Before you can start to manage anything, you need a strategy. You need context. From the top level understanding is how you build out the details. These standards are designed to build that top level understanding and enable you to build out the details specific to your company size, your industry vertical, and of course your individual company strategy and requirements. These standards are adopted around the world and have a continual heartbeat of large companies saying, we're using this. We use this internally. We'd like our supply chain to use it as well. Volvo just announced a couple of hours ago their adoption of ISO 5230. That is really cool. It's another heartbeat in a range of companies around the world of all types, all industries, all sizes, that say publicly, we are using these ISO standards. And they signal to their supply chain that using these ISO standards is important to them in the context of managing open source software. <clears throat> now, the companies that come to us and say, we're using your ISO standards, you can put our logo on your website, are a tiny subset of the total number of companies using these standards. For example, research sponsored by PwC in Germany showed that 31% of large German companies are using or plan to use ISO 5230. So you're looking at a situation here where standards for managing open source are becoming de facto for people managing open source. People are getting used to the idea that this is how we do business with open source in the supply chain. This is how we address open source compliance, open source security assurance in the supply chain. Now, the reason that these are ISO standards instead of, let's say, just a specification, uh, just a de facto industry standard, the reason they're ISO standards is because ISO standards are a really good shorthand to say to people, here's what something is. Here's a document format. Here's a quality program. The ISO standard is a really good shorthand to say, when we do open source license compliance, for example, the baseline that we're looking at is 5230. It captures the entire conversation into a clear description. And the open chain standards are the baseline for open source license compliance and open source security assurance. Notice I said baseline. Remember I said these are high-level standards. They don't solve every problem. They set the context. 
they're a way that you can approach the supply chain and say, here's our starting point. Here's how we work from the same page. Now, specifically, this talk is designed to give you some insight into what we expect to happen around these standards in this year. So procurement negotiations are obviously a huge part of how ISO standards are used. That shorthand for saying, here's a quality approach, here's what I want, is commonly deployed when two companies sit down and one company says, I want to buy something from you. Now in the past around open source, this process uh, often was quite torturous when it came to open source because people had to explain what did I mean by open source, what are my parameters, how do I expect you to manage it, etc., etc. In 2024, we expect increased normalization of the fact that you don't need 12 or 15 pages describing what you mean when you say open source compliance, what you mean when you say open source security assurance. Instead, you can say, I want ISO 5230. That's where I'm at with license compliance. I know that's the industry standard. With that normalization of standards around open source, and it's not just open chain standards, every standard that's impacting open source, we do expect the open chain standards to be increasingly visible in procurement. They're already there, but we, increase, uh, we expect that to increase dramatically. And as that happens, we expect and of course advocate for more support for legal professionals in this area. Uh, the open source community and conferences like this, I mean we have a couple of thousand people at this event. A few months ago at KubeCon in Paris they had 15,000 people. These are big conferences but they're a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean compared to the supply chain. I mean, we're talking enormous supply chains. In open source, we're increasingly aware of things like open source standards. In open source procurement, we are increasingly aware of utilizing this. But for a lot of the supply chain, they're barely aware of open source, let alone industry trends in management. So one of the important things we expect this year is more support for legal professionals. As procurement occurs, as customer companies say, I'd like ISO 5230. We already have a website, people can find out something, but we expect more and more material to help lawyers that see this for the first time to get insights. And we're very lucky that people have been talking about these things, sharing information all the time. Uh, one example, which is kind of cool because Russ is right there, <coughs> is that BlackBerry has just been uh, doing a lot about our standards in particular uh, BlackBerry, OSS Consultants, that's Russ, and OpenChain just released a case study about how and why BlackBerry used 5230. That kind of material spreading around the world allows people to Google and get started. Now, an exciting thing that we really didn't expect when we started OpenChain was the use of our standards for managing open source in mergers and acquisitions. So we started out thinking the supply chain is kind of broken with open source license compliance at the time. We can do something about that together and in the end we'll make a specification around that. We thought it would solve for trust in the supply chain, but it turns out it also solves for trust and fidelity in mergers and acquisitions. So we found that ISO 5230 and ISO 18974 provide a type of floor for quality around how is an acquisition target, a company I'm thinking of buying, dealing with open source compliance or security assurance. And whether they explicitly say they're using 5230 or 18974, those standards, those high level standards, identify process points that we know are necessary for quality compliance programs or assurance programs. So we can take these standards, hold them up, check a target's uh, internal governance and see if they're covering all of the key points. And if not, we know that there's something missing. 
And that means there's a risk involved that we need to address in M&A. Quite frankly, we didn't expect that to be a huge part of Open Chain when we started, but it turns out that a lot of people find this very valuable. And we do expect the Open Chain standards to be more and more a part of the default toolkit. When a company is buying another company, pulling out these ISO standards and saying, where are you at with your processes? Do you, at a minimum, cover these process points? We think that will increasingly be part of the standard toolkit. And that will lead increasingly to a rise in the quality of governance in startups and smaller entities, which are typical acquisition targets. Neither of these things will be super dramatic this year. I mean, it takes a while for toolkits to be built, and it takes even longer for the quality of, let's say, startups to improve across a supply chain. But we see that as a trend that will be increased. And we do see more documentation or case studies in this domain. Uh, we found a lot of companies helping in M&A are pretty glad to talk about it. And when things like service providers in our ecosystem get together, they often have a lot to say on this topic. In this year, I hope to capture more of that in documentation that will support development. Supply chain management. This is actually why we started, by the way. We sat down and said, what can make a trusted open source supply chain from the perspective of license compliance? And later, what can make a trusted open source supply chain from the perspective of security assurance? Uh, we expect essentially what we've been doing for a while to continue, that these standards will be the baseline uh, for open source compliance and security assurance. They're the easy way to describe minimal expectations. And if you don't use these standards, if you don't use the type of process content of these standards, you are letting process gaps appear in how you deal with your supply chain. Now, we do expect an increased number of supply chain requests for open chain standards. Um, we, of course, as an organization building the standards, and these are ISO standards, we don't have direct insight into what various companies do on their specific um, activities with their suppliers. But from what we see in public presentations, more and more companies are going through a cycle of saying, be aware of these standards. Then we prefer to see these standards used by you. And then we require these standards to be used by you. So we're seeing that cycle develop over the years. We expect that to continue in this year. And we expect a shift towards something important, and I'll expand on it in a minute. Um, maturity models that increasingly include the open chain standards. A lot of companies use maturity models to he help assess which supplier to work with. Where's the supplier at in their governance and how they run their company? And in the last year or two, we've had multiple parties tell us that they're beginning to use open chain standards in maturity modeling. We expect that to become more and more prevalent. It doesn't sound exciting, but I think that's one of the most exciting things that's occurring because maturity modeling is a huge determinant in professional supply chain management at scale. And of course, we expect to see more governance, governments referencing open chain standards. Uh, we've been very lucky to have significant traction in places like Japan, where open chain has been cited in open source uh, guidance from the government. We're seeing it happen in China. We're seeing it occur in Korea. And we're seeing increased dialogues. For instance, last week, um, I was talking with some people from the commission. We're seeing increased dialogues about how the open chain approach might also support governmental approaches to managing technology. That's cool, and I like it. Hi. A very good question. The answer is scattered over the Open Chain website. But the second answer is that on my to-do list is to make a clearer list of the actual links in one place. You're very welcome. It's a good question. And uh, you'll have to forgive me, though. For instance, the Japanese reference is, in fact, in Japanese. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll have the link, but you'll have to trust me on this. 
uh, or ask the Japanese community members sitting in the row behind you. <laughs> I see Sony, <laughs> I see Toyota, and I see Hitachi <laughs> solutions. Um, the CRA is a very big topic uh, in all of open source. It's really been a trending topic for us. And one thing that's come up is how does this impact stuff like the open chain standards? And the answer is pretty well, actually. The open chain standards have always asked people to create and archive verification materials. In other words, to have a record of what you just did. What did you ingest? Who have you trained? What's their responsibility? What are you now sending out into the world? Our fundamental approach of asking for basic record keeping around license compliance and security assurance is perfectly compatible with the approach of the CRA. In other words, um, we're obviously not a standard for the CRA. It's a separate thing. But our approach is perfectly aligned with the mental model that they've got in trying to increase accountability, record keeping, and so on. So addressing the CRA, we already do it. What we want to do is have more records. Uh, with things like the CRA, they're requiring more records. Nice alignment, no controversy. Now, I mentioned we're high-level standard, okay? So we're way up there at the top, and we're setting the context, the broad sweep of have a process for inbound, have internal process training and policy, have a process for outbound. We don't cover implementation, but we do require that you have a software bill of materials. Then we don't, don't go into specifics beyond that, but we do require that, we always have both for license compliance and security. And this means when it comes to things like SPDX, we're in perfect alignment. You can think of it like stacking standards. Open chain, ISO 5230, license compliance, ISO 18974, security assurance, sets the broad stroke of your approach. Then something like SPDX starts to fill in implementation. I need a software bill, bill of materials, what can I use? Oh, I could use SPDX. Now, in 2024, SPDX is evolving. There's an ISO standard version, ISO 5962. By the way, I'm still amazed I can remember all these numbers. <laughs> I sound like it's easy. It's not. It took me ages. ISO 5962, the SPDX standard for software bill of materials, has been out since 2021. Perfectly compatible with both of the open chain standards for open source software management. But in the future, where SPDX is going next, with SPDX generation three, uh, we see increased synchronization. So in the next generation of SPDX, they're splitting into profiles. So you can have a profile for license compliance, you can have a profile for security, and so on and so forth. What they're doing increasingly and organically uh, aligns well with our family of standards as well. So we have license compliance, we have security. You can use one or the other or both. SPDX can perfectly support one or the other or both, particularly with SPDX 3. Not sure when SPDX 3 will become an ISO standard, release to be determined, but you know it's on the horizon and it's a nice development. I would put a proviso though that of course, the open chain standards are compatible with all SBOM formats. Like I said, we don't determine implementation details. We say have an SBOM, and then the details of what SBOM, what fidelity of that SBOM, that's up to you. Because different industries, different companies, different supply chains have different requirements. Just wanted to flag that because there are other SBOM formats out there, and people sometimes ask us about, you know, compatibility with our standards and so on. Yeah, compatible with everything. Now, open chain building standards is useful, but reading ISO standards is not incredibly useful for companies. So to support the actual use of standards in the market, to change it from, hey, this is a good idea, into, hey, this is practical for my company, we have extensive reference material available. And this reference material includes stuff which became very popular outside of our direct standardization work. 
like our reference training slides, uh, went all over the world, used by all types of companies, consultancies, user companies, for their internal purposes, both wonderfully and sadly not always to adopt our standards, sometimes just because they liked our training. We have policy template material. So if you're sitting down and thinking, I want to make an open source policy, what are my options? We have templating material to help you think through that. We have supplier education material. That actually originates in our Japan work group, which is one of the most active parts of the Open Chain project. And the supplier education material uh, provides a wonderful thing, a single attachment you can send in an email to any supplier in the world that helps them go from what is open source anyway through to how to use these standards. That's very cool. And of course, Lots of self-certification material to help companies adopt the ISO standards. I'll be touching on that again in a minute. Um, OpenChain builds open standards, and our reference material is very open, too. It's hosted on GitHub, and almost all of it is licensed under CC0, effectively public domain. So people can ingest, use, do whatever they want with it, and that's totally fine. In fact, it's encouraged. Now, the existing reference material is useful, but several times in my talk, I alluded to the fact that we need more material to help people in areas like procurement, supply chain management, merger and acquisitions, and we're working on that. Oops, wrong slide. Ooh, I forgot I added this slide. This is an accidental awesomeness of the Open Chain project, okay? In, in COVID times, the world ground to a halt, April 2020, was when we said, let's start doing webinars because we don't know when we can see each other again. And since April 2020 until today, we've released over 80 webinars covering everything. Everything from automation options to big sweeps about what does this organization do in this domain to deep dives on SPDX, explorations of how our ISO standards work, discussions about how standards are made in a broader sense everything. And if you go to our website, QR code right there, you'll find the webinars in a searchable format. Yeah, I, I shoved that slide in because I just thought it was so amazing when we counted the webinars and it was a real case of, gosh, that's a lot. And we'll be doing webinars very shortly in collaboration with Open Forum Europe on things like the CRA, the Product Liability Act, and the AI uh, regulation in the EU. So we've got a ton of really cool webinars coming in the next month and a half. Let's see if we can hit 100 this year. All right. Now, existing reference material, great. But as I alluded earlier, we need more reference material in the market. We need more support for lawyers and for other people like managers on how to deal with open source management. And then, of course, how to deal with our standards, the open chain standards and other topics. We've had a very busy education work group working on this stuff for a while. They are now ready to release an update to our training slides very soon. In fact, the first release should be this month or early next month. They're ready to release an updated supplier education leaflet. Uh, it's actually done, the second generation international version. We're kicking it over to the Japan work group, making sure that they're happy with it. And if so, we'll translate it into multiple languages and push it out maybe in May or June. Our telco work group, another part of this disparate project, was working on the question of SBOM quality. Not SBOM standards, but rather, what are the fundamentals in telco that we'd need to determine that an SBOM from a supplier is of high enough quality for us to be happy? And they were working on that for a year or two. And then they realized what they were working on would actually be good for every industry. So they've kicked it over to the education work group and we're about to release an SBOM quality guide. That won't tell you what SBOM format to use. It will tell you what might be a good baseline for you to determine that an SBOM you're getting from a supplier is good enough for your requirements. Not prescriptive, but to help you set context. Cool thing that's coming, explainers for different business roles. This is actually a full circle. When we started Open Chain in 2016, we made a few leaflets like Open Chain for Managers, 
OpenChain for developers. Now those fell by the wayside. And in 2024, we're coming right back to it and having uh, the development of new explainers to hand to different departments in your company when people say, why should I care? And we're gonna be uh, releasing those in the next few months to help them get the context they need and understand that managing open source professionally, effectively, requires things like standards and it's not a large barrier to entry. And finally, the maturity models. I mentioned that different companies have told me that they're increasingly adding our standards into maturity modeling. If you're not familiar with it, maturity modeling is a way to set baselines of levels of fidelity on how a company does anything. Let's say maturity modeling around how a company builds a product or maturity modeling around how a company manages intellectual property. Now, commercial maturity modeling is a very well developed field including open source standards into maturity modeling is new. We're hearing that companies are doing that, but more excitingly, we're about to get contributions, public domain to the open chain project of reference maturity models that will allow everyone in the world to pick up examples of maturity modeling using open source standards and use that as inspiration, no barrier to entry, no need to pay for access, no need to work with anyone else. Download and go, think it through, learn for yourself. That's very cool. Supporting education material, though, requires people to set context. And I started mentioning work groups like Telco, education. OpenChain has a huge community. There's over a thousand companies involved in our direct access in our work groups and mailing lists and so on. We have the big picture things, work group for specifications, work group for education. We have kind of community discussion areas where people talk about tooling or export control or something like that. Call it an area for people to talk through a subject and maybe work on something like some reference material. We have an emergence recently of study groups where people are able to say, we don't know what should be done here yet, but let's talk through the problem domain. AI kicked off in January, and they're having some awesome discussions. More on that later. We have industry-specific groups. So automotive, chaired by Endosat, who's sitting right over there from Toyota. Uh, and we have uh, telecom work group, uh, chaired by Marc Aton from Nokia, who's presumably in France right now. Telco, as I mentioned, made an SBOM quality guide for themselves and realized, oh, this could work for every industry and kicked it over to the global education work group. Most interestingly, especially when you consider not everyone speaks English, we have regional user groups. And these work groups um, allow people to get together in places like Japan, Korea, China, and talk about open source management, open chain standards, and experienced. Um, methods, experience learned, knowledge shared in their own languages. These work groups have been fundamental to the success of building our ISO standards. We've been very lucky in places like Japan where we have around 180 people in the Japan work group. Uh, in Korea, we have about 120, I believe. In China, we've got 334 as of today. Uh, so lots of people uh, communicating about lots of stuff and helping each other out. Remember, this stuff is user companies. These are people like you. So it's really a case of turn up and ask a question and someone can help you. You might turn up and say, I'm using OpenChain, I'm using SPDX. Uh, I don't want to just manually read all this. How do I automate? Go to our tooling work group. You'll find the people who can tell you how to automate using open source tools, using proprietary tools, whatever. They can talk it through with you because they've done that. It's very cool. Now, apart from community support, of course, there's tons of commercial support as well for things like the Open Chain Standards. Um, we have an official partner ecosystem. And what that means is uh, a company collaborates with Open Chain. They commit to helping us with things like education material, being part of our community as a contributor, and they can use our trademark in their service offerings as an official partner. As you can see, we have a ton 
of official partners in our ecosystem. Now, this isn't all the companies that support our standards. Bear in mind, these are ISO standards. Every provider that supports ISO standards can help you with open chain. These are the companies that have committed to working with our community and giving us support and materials and so on and so forth. So if you look up there at the top, you know, you've got third party certifiers, 15 of them. All around the world, there are companies that can help you adopt the standards if you want third party certification. Proviso and footnote. Remember earlier I said self-certification is available. You have a choice. Uh, we have tooling and automation providers, legal providers, consultancies all around the world. So for instance, I mentioned OSS consultants. Russ, he's part of the official partner program. Ayumi from Hitachi Solutions. They're part of the official partner program. Hey. <laughs> and uh, so many more. And everyone who's there helps us run things, helps us support the user community. And it's been really cool. I mean, it's, it's easy to get cynical about commercial companies and think they're always selling product. Not true. These companies are contributing and contributing. For instance, PwC often hosts our meetings in Germany to give us a space. Uh, Ayumi has been elected chair of the Japan work group recently. Lots of cool people doing cool things. Now, this is where I'm going to begin wrapping up the talk with a couple of notes. I've mentioned this a few times over the years, uh, but I think it's really becoming noticeable this year that open source is becoming more professional, more accountable, and more sustainable. Or to put it another way, open source is growing up. The trend we're seeing, and the open chain standards are a small part of this, the trend we're seeing is that open source is moving closer and closer to traditional software asset management. It's no longer a special exception. It's no longer an unknown. We increasingly know how to manage this, and we increasingly integrate it into all our other software activities. And that's a good thing. Uh, this will escalate this year. I'm convinced that everything you've seen happening, for instance, the recent security scares related to open source, contribute to the professionalization accountability and sustainability of this field. The open chain standards were early. We built the first standard in 2016. But we're part of an inevitable market evolution. And we support all the other aspects of the evolution. And that's going to be important. When it comes to how people think about managing open source next, as they try to discuss it, as they try to think through where do we need more processes, where do we need more open source standards. Open Chain is committed to supporting that discussion. So we are building trust in the supply chain. We are supp supporting professional open source management at every level. I guess that's a long way of saying that everything else you're seeing in the market to try to manage open source is compatible with what we do. And we're open to discussing and supporting everyone doing this stuff, which is nice. Uh, one example of the type of open dialogue we have, and this is only a very narrow slice, but the open chain project develops our standards in a very open way. You know, when we say open chain, we mean an open supply chain. We also mean everything we do is open source method. Our current standards are hosted on GitHub, but more than hosted on GitHub, uh, we develop the standards on GitHub. We are currently drafting proposed updates to our license compliance and security assurance standard. That doesn't mean that we're updating them soon. What it means is that we're doing all of the work, all of the thinking in public. And that's because you're invited to the party. Everything that goes into thinking about our standards and thinking about the evolving market, thinking about what's needed next, we capture on GitHub issues and we talk through and anyone in the world can turn up, look at this, leave their notes, open new issues and help build out what happens next in this aspect of open source management. I gave you this example for two reasons. One, it underlines our commitment to truly open open source management. And two, I think it's a, a good example of 
how someone with new ideas, someone with new concerns, um, can bring them to us. I see people are taking photos, so I'm pausing there for a moment. All righty. Now, the way you can get involved is pretty simple. Uh, we have mailing lists, we have Slack, and we have monthly calls. And the monthly calls are pretty cool because they provide a way for you to literally listen in as people talk about things, which both gives you access to their knowledge and gives you real awareness that these people are not some super different species. They're just like you. Uh, we're chairing our spec work group at the moment with Chris Wood. He's a fellow at Lockheed Martin, and he was really critical in building the security standard. Uh, and he and the rest of the work group have one call a month for North America and Europe, one call a month for North America and Asia. Uh, and this allows everyone to sync up, work on the standards, and catch up with other project news. You are invited to do that. If you follow the QR code, you'll find those calls. All of our other international calls, our mailing list, our Slack, our WeChat, everything there. And like I said, uh, all you have to do to be part of it is turn up. And quite frankly, what happens a lot is people turn up and lurk for a while, and then inevitably they contribute, which is awesome. Every voice matters. Now, OpenChain doesn't just do its stuff in its lane. It also supports discussions around new areas of open collaboration and governance. People have a lot of ideas, and we're dealing with a very big supply chain. OpenChain covers an unusual ground in that companies that aren't part of the normal open source ecosystem often drift into us, and they might come to us let's say for license compliance. But then they might also bring other questions to the table. We try to welcome the questions where something exists to support them, redirect them there. And where something doesn't exist, maybe open a new dialogue. This is a big intro, intro to, for instance, our AI compliance study group. Right now, so many people are talking about AI. And a lot of people are talking about functional aspects of AI, let's say, how do you get an open source LLM? Um, a lot of people are talking about things like, how should AI data sets be licensed? And so on and so forth. Now, open chain uh, is narrowly scoped. You might have noticed I keep saying supply chain and trust. That's what we're interested in. So when it comes to topics like, how do I find an open source LLM? What's happening there? Well, LFAI and data, and they have uh, their new um, openness modeling. When it comes to questions like data set licensing, well, you know, Linux Foundation has not only LFAI and data, but prior work around data modeling. When it comes to trust in the supply chain, AI compliance in the supply chain, our study group is talking. They're whittling down. Is there a common set of challenges crossing all industry verticals? about AI compliance. If I'm moving packet X, which could be AI algorithms, it could be AI data sets, actually, who cares? If I'm moving AI-related package X through the supply chain, what are the fundamental processes I might need to manage that? We're discussing if we can find those commonalities. And if we can, perhaps we can make some reference material about the baseline for AI compliance in the supply chain. It's an interesting discussion, and we're, of course, ensuring all voices are heard. It's a different type of discussion to what you might have seen with, let's say, OSI with their open source AI definition. Very different type of dialogue. We're trying to work out in the supply chain, moving AI through commercial entities, what are the touch points that we might have in common. And of course, from there, Looking at implementation, that's where more detailed work comes in. Let's see where it goes. You're welcome to join. The only barrier is clicking join. All right. I wanted to wrap up very quickly uh, with some data points. So last year was an interesting year for OpenChain. You know, we saw a doubling of our standards maintained. We had the new security standard come out and join the license compliance standard. That was cool. Uh, we saw a doubling of third-party certifiers, which meant that the coverage, if you needed help with certification, 
was dramatically increased, which we regard as a really good indicator of market maturity, but also choice. You know, you have multiple providers if you want help. That's cool. And we dramatically increased the usability and accessibility of things like self-certification. So our self-certification checklists online, I think, are improved from where we were before, and they're easier to take and remix into your internal materials. Incidentally, this stuff doesn't mean that you have to be using our standards. You can take our self-certification checklists and just use them as internal checklists to see how your companies do it. You know, are we missing something that could be useful for us? Is there an area we could focus resources? A lot of people use our material for that, and it's a good thing. In our view, if you start aligning with the industry standards, over time you'll be in a position to adopt them, and that's what we want to see. Meanwhile, that can just help you out. Anyway, those data points about last year are just a taste. We actually increased in every metric. For instance, the amount of companies coming to us and saying, hey, you can put our logo on your website, we're using your standards, increased by almost 23%. Uh, we saw significant adoption of our new uh, security standard in terms of big companies coming to the table and saying, we're using this, uh, even before it was granted by ISO. So for instance, BlackBerry, uh, Russ Ealing helped out again, uh, was one of the early companies to say we're using this security spec. LG Electronics, on the day that the ISO standard was released, uh, we had Kakalo Bank say that they're using the security standard. Very nice metrics. This year, what's gonna happen? The boring headline is that we're going to quietly assist in the professionalization of the supply chain around open source. So we are providing tools that allow companies to make things more predictable. And that's exactly what will continue this year without hesitation. Uh, we do think that the impact in procurement, M&A, and supply chain management will be especially noticeable. And that's why this talk is slightly geared towards legal professionals. You know, these are situations where the lawyers at the table will be thinking, what do I need to put in the dialogue with the company across the table for me? What do I need to have as my fundamentals as we get this done? Now, we're going to be supporting people with more material around our standards, as always. But we also expect a growing amount of materials from other parties to assist. So we're seeing things like organizations in our partner ecosystem releasing materials. We're seeing user companies release materials and presentations. One example is SAP did a ton of material between 2022 and 2023 talking about using our standards, how, why, impact. Very cool. All of that will continue, and that's nice. I do want to make myself available to talk to you more about this stuff. The open chain standards are obviously my primary motivation, but the whole topic of professionalization and open source, what are the barriers to entry? How scary or expensive is it? What are the shortcuts? What friends can you make? How can we connect you with the right people? I'm available, and I do want to absolutely emphasize that that availability is without condition. I don't think that I need to sell you these standards. I think these standards are inevitable in the same way that it's inevitable that open source will become a very standard part of software asset management. So what I wanna do is help you in your maturity transitioning, help you answer your questions and connect you with the right people. We've been fortunate to build just a wonderful community around this. And I think that community, in many languages, uh, will only serve to get bigger and more helpful over time. Alrighty, that's it for me. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. I see a question. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. I think there's two parts to the answer. The first we see is that, zooming back, the self-certification checklists are probably the key document because people read an ISO standard and interpreting that can be a real heavy lift. So the self-certification we saw helped people a lot. But one of the key barriers that we've faced is that we don't define process content. And that means that you can pretty much do anything as long as you have a process in place. But most people want to do the best they can. So one of the biggest barriers to adoption we've seen is companies trying to go too far too fast and not being ready. So one example is we in the license compliance standard require that you make people aware of your open source policy. Now, there's many ways to do that. Yeah. And this is where we need to improve and help people because we've had situations where people start to think about very complex Im implementations to get everyone aware, et cetera, et cetera. But the simplest answer is you can send an email. Yeah, SBOM works too. So yeah, one of our greatest barriers to entry is the human predication to trying to do their best. And sometimes what really needs to be done is start minimal and build out from there. Scope a really narrow program, really simple processes. Make sure it works, and then gradually use approaches like Kaizen, continual improvement. And I think that's a message we've been trying to share for years. We've tried to help with documentation, but we haven't nailed it yet. So that, that's what I'd say is one of the main barriers that I see. Alrighty, any other questions? I see one in the back. No, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we don't do the type of webinars that do that at this juncture. But if you want to get hooked up with people who do, you know, email me and I'll be very glad to assist. So the reason we don't do that stuff, just putting this up here so you got my email. The reason we don't do that stuff is because we want to make sure that the webinars are really community feel. So we invite our speakers, we give them a topic, uh, but we let them run with it. And this is a little bit different from the more structured approach to things that give you, for instance, the, the legal credits. So we purposefully try to act as a more general onboarding to the knowledge base. Uh, we don't try to act as some kind of uh, educational certification provider or similar. Uh, there are providers for instance, many bar associations have webinars that do provide credits, and there are providers of various certificates. For instance, LF training have certi certificates in various domains as well. We haven't done that because we regard our core mission as narrowly scoped to providing the standards and reference material. And for that reason, that's what we do. Alrighty, any further questions? If not, thank you very much, and I'm going to the airport, flying to Sweden, and giving another talk. <laughs> thank you.